as you see, the word has two, sustainability and science. The science, that the future belongs to science and those who make friendship with science. Because if there is a problem, there is a solution. You will have to find a scientific solution. If it's a technological problem, only science can solve the problem. The other is sustainability. Sustainability for too long, we thought, means our economic sustainability. In other words, having money to buy and so on. A business, for example, the balance sheet shows whether it's sustainable or not. If your balance sheet is very adverse, not sustainable. Then came the environmental issues because a large number of enterprises, business activities, like for example mining, all of them depend on natural resources. Agriculture. Agriculture depends entirely on natural resources, land, water, biodiversity, and climate. Therefore, the sustainable management of uh, the basic life support systems, which support life on this earth, like land, water, it becomes very important. And the third aspect is social sustainability, because whatever we do must benefit everybody. If there are winners and losers, it will not be sustainable, because the losers will always be against what has been done. Therefore, sustainability, sustainability science is bringing the best of inquiry, the best of questioning mind, best of knowledge, because as uh, Spencer said, science is search after truth. You try to find out what is the correct one. How do you make development or our own living sustainable? This is the purpose of this course. May I say a few words about uh, the different aspects of uh, sustainability science, which our st whoever is taking the courses, they will hear more about it, they will learn more about it. First of all, in the environmental sustainability, which is now uh, on the forefront next year, is what we call Rio plus 20, 20 years after the Earth Summit held in Rio de Janeiro in June to 1992, and 40 years after Stockholm, the first human United Nations conference on the human environment was held in Stockholm uh, in 1972. Uh, and uh, that's where Indira Gandhi made the famous statement that unless you look after the poor, and they look after the human dimension of sustainability, uh, purely talking about the panda, the penguin, and all the other uh, the symbols of conservation. Uh, they, that will not be done. It cannot be managed unless you also look after the human beings. That is how the concept of social sustainability was introduced in the whole question of uh, measurement of sustainability. The environmental sustainability of the life support system, for example, this course talks about from the green to an evergreen revolution. I mentioned earlier, agriculture uh, is a profession which depends on, on soil, water, <coughs> biodiversity, and climate, among other things. Uh, ob obviously, all the soil uh, fertility must be maintained. Evergreen revolution means improvement of productivity in perpetuity without ecological harm. Uh, because the Green Revolution was criticized by environmentalists uh, by saying excessive use of fertilizer, excessive use of pesticide, overdrawing of water. We take, for example, Punjab. The Punjab agriculture is both in economic and ecological distress. Uh, ecological distress because the groundwater <coughs> has been overexploited. Salinity has come up and so on. That is not sustainable. We have to maintain it. This is why agriculture sustainability, which is the basis of sustainable food security, will have to be based upon the conservation, not only the conservation, but the enhancement of our resources like soil. Soil fertility not only should be maintained, but should be improved by introducing earthworms uh, and so on. Many methods, biofertilizers, you can improve it. Same is both water, both water quality, it was, uh, it was Silence, the book uh, by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring in 1964, which started a serious thought on the question of environmental sustainability. Because uh, what we call Green Revolution really started the United States in the late 40s when they started uh, um, growing more of hybrid corn, hybrid maize with a large amount of fertilizer. And soon, uh, use of fertilizer and DDT as a pesticide uh, was very widespread, with the result 
eutrophication of the lakes, the pollution of the lakes, the water, uh, all of them was described by in the in the book, beautiful book on Silent Spring. From that time onwards, we became conscious of the need to look at the environmental impact of development, impact of development, whether it is <coughs> agricultural development or industrial development or any kind of manufacturing. For example, the state where I live now, Tamil Nadu, the two major industries are leather and textiles. Both of them are in distress because the leather, effluents from the leather industry are polluting the water and so on. Yeah. Similarly, the famous place called Tirupur, where in one small town over 1,000 crores worth of foreign exchange is being earned by export of textiles. Unfortunately, again, the dye pollution, if you go the, to the river nearby, so that <coughs> our courts, now the green benches are there in our courts, they have said that it should be either stop, uh, pollution should be stopped, or the industry should be closed, either way. Closing industry is not an option for us because there were population of 120 crore of people, uh, 1.2 billion people, we have out of whom more than 50% are below the age of 30. They require jobs, they require some uh, income and so on. Therefore, we have to create more jobs and not uh, just close down the jobs we already have. Now, in the case of economics, the difference between normal economics and environmental economics is environmental economics, we can't allow depreciation. How do you allow depreciation to water or soil or climate and so on? And otherwise, in conventional economics, depreciation is almost compulsory. But in the case of environmental assets, we can't, uh, we can only appreciate, not depreciate. The other important difference is the environmental economics take into account intergenerational equity, not only intragenerational. It is not only the population which is now inhabiting India, but also the children, the women and men who, of, of, who are yet to be born, the children who are yet to be born, their own fate is also important. What we do today may determine their fate in the future. So in all these areas, whether ecological economics or environmental economics, uh, we require a much more detailed understanding of both the long-term and the short-term uh, development. This is why the Brundtland Commission, chaired by Mrs. Grove, Grove Harlan Brunklin, uh, then Prime Minister of Norway, a uh, very famous report called Our Common Future. It emphasized that sustainable development means development today should not be at the expense of prospects for development tomorrow. In other words, today and tomorrow are not in conflict, but uh, which are mutually reinforced. And uh, this is why the Brunklin Report's commission was also called Our Common Future, uh, to underline the fact uh, whether it is within within a country or among nations, whatever may be our political frontiers, ecologically our fates are intertwined. Today we have a debate on climate change. You may go on talking who is responsible for climate change. Industrialized countries, obviously, their emissions are very high. The carbon emissions are more than carbon absorption. Therefore, you have all the time problem. But who is going to have the impact it is not the, the, the worst impact will be on developing countries, on poor nations, and the poor on all nations. For example, in agriculture, uh, one to two degrees centigrade higher temperature, which is what they are negotiating uh, at uh, various international conferences, uh, will affect our own wheat production, our rice production, and so on. And uh, sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia will be the worst affected by an increase in temperature. We may say we are not responsible for it, but the fact remains, whoever is responsible, the impact will be on those uh, who will suffer. This is why it is called our common future. The report is called our common future to emphasize that all of us are ecologically intertwined, what is called the web of life, the web of life. If you destroy one segment of the web, the whole web collapses. And this is what we have to learn. Let me say a few words about uh, uh, the whole question of food security, sustainable food security, because food is the first among the hierarchical needs of a human being. And these days we talk about hunger strikes and so on. People say, how long can you be without food? And some people can live longer, some people cannot live as long and so on. Therefore, food is, 
fundamental requirement and uh, that is endangered endangered today on the one hand what is called the fatigue of the green revolution the reason is that uh, environmental problems ecological problems the land the water biodiversity and above all the climate the climate issues more re more frequent droughts more frequent floods uh, more because the himalayan snow melt will require more and then rise in sea level all along the coastline nearly uh, one third of the population of india live within 50 kilometers from the shoreline and the world as a whole nearly 40 percent live near the shoreline if the sea level is going to go up we have had some example of tsunami uh, the tsunami of 2004 January 26, 2000, uh, December 26, 2004, was a wake-up call, as we call them. Uh, our people could get an idea what a tsunami means, what sea level rise will mean, and so on. So we have problems along the coast, along the islands, Andaman, Nicobar Islands, as well as of uh, Lakshadweep group of islands. Here, uh, my last point is there is a lot of traditional wisdom on dealing with climate change, with adaptation. When Professor Keshavan led a team uh, to develop a plan for the Andamans, the report, he called it uh, post-tsunami, the new Andamans. Uh, there he pointed out that the various tribes in Nicobar Island, the Great Nicobar, which was the nearest to the epicenter of the tsunami, because in Sumatra, very near, uh, they thought, people thought that the tribal people are all drowned and dead because there was no news. Even the media said, I don't, we don't know what has happened to these people. But then he found they were all hale and hearty. When asked, you know, they said, uh, they, they gave a number of uh, indicator, indicators of something, they didn't call it tsunami, something terrible happening in the sea. Uh, the way in which some wave came and receded very fast, the crabs' behavior and so on. So they got onto the top of the highest tree, tallest tree they could get hold of. So after two days they came down. People were surprised. This is what we call indigenous knowledge or traditional wisdom. So we have to, in sustainability science, to be sustainable, we have to blend modern science with traditional wisdom, traditional knowledge. Both of them have to come together, otherwise uh, we will lose the wisdom of the ages. For example, water harvesting. The Center for Science and Environment has a book called Dying Wisdom. Sunita Narayan and Agarwal, Anil Agarwal, who is no more, uh, they have pointed out what are all the methods which were used in the past for harvesting water. A place like Chirapunji or Sora, as it is now called in Meghalaya, with 14,000 millimeters of rainfall, you don't get water during the month of December, January, February. On the other hand, uh, if you go to Barmer, Jaisalmer, with 50 to 60 millimeters of rainfall, remember 14,060, somehow people give you some water. If you go there, the first thing the lady does is to give you some water and so on. There are traditional methods of water conservation. So we must revive. In the field of sustainability science, those who are taking this course should remember the first important requirement for sustainable development is sustainable lifestyles. Sustainable lifestyles where we conserve the conservation, a life devoted to conserving the water, conserving uh, electricity, whatever, or energy and so on, the conservation ethos must permeate. Uh, unsustainable lifestyles and unacceptable poverty. These are the two greatest enemies of sustainable development. Unsustainable lifestyles because we will make too much demand on natural resources. What is now called ecological footprint. Each one of us, the demand <coughs> we make on natural resources. And unacceptable poverty because uh, then there will be no social sustainability. There will always be conflicts, there will be problems, there will be violence, uh, social uh, uh, in a way, what is now called Arab Spring, what has happened in the Middle East, is attributed to growing extreme affluence and extreme poverty. Uh, up to a point, people are willing to take it. Afterward, they will not take it. This is why I said social sustainability is important. I hope all the scholars and others who take this course uh, on sustainability science uh, will at least promote the concept that sustainability demands the end of un unsustainable lifestyle and unacceptable poverty. Thank you very much.